Well, what an amazing passage this is in Philippians 2. And Philippians is such a, it's only four chapters, but there's so much, so much in this book. And, and you know, I can, you can just keep coming back to it and learning so many new things from it just constantly. Um, but the passage we're going to be in today, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, and verse 5. And because um, it, it covers the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So, all right, so let's pray. Oh Lord God of heaven, we thank you again that we're able to be together this morning to worship you. And I thank you. I thank you that we are able to be here. And I think of other areas, especially well, well north of us that are are shut down on this day because of the, the, the lake effect snow that's just hitting them up there. I pray for, for the Watertown area that you would protect the people there and, and just pray that it'll stop soon. But Lord, I thank you that we're down here and the sun is shining outside. And yes, it's cold, but we have, we have warmth. We have heat. We have a roof over our heads. You have truly blessed us in more ways than we could count even in a single day. And I pray that this time now would bless you. That you would be the one that is magnified as we, we look at this incarnation of Jesus Christ and what it means for us today. In these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus Christ is God. Before time began, in eternity past, Jesus Christ was there. He has always existed before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the sky, the stars, the universe. Jesus Christ is over all. Jesus Christ is all. Before time began, Jesus Christ dwelt with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ is God the Son, the eternal source of love and truth. In the beginning, Jesus Christ created time and then light for all to see one day, and the sun and the moon, and he knows all of the stars, and he named them too. Jesus Christ willingly left heaven and was incarnated as a baby in the womb of Mary. He was not born in a city like Jerusalem or Rome or Athens. Jesus Christ was born in the small town of Bethlehem and placed in an animal feeding trough to sleep after being swaddled in rags. His earthly parents were poor and from the poorest section of Israel. There are riches untold in heaven and perfect love in heaven. And Jesus Christ set all of that aside in order to dwell among his creation. The night of his birth, Jesus Christ was visited by shepherds that were watching their flocks in the field by night. There were not spectacular celebrations the night of his birth. 
There were no parties thrown. The spectators to his birth were farm animals. Jesus Christ, interestingly enough, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills as well. And he was born into the humblest of all beginnings. And yet, nobody has had more influence over the world than Jesus Christ. Nobody has more books written about him. Nobody has had more songs sung about him. Nobody has had the effect Jesus Christ has had upon people. And nobody can approach the Lord God of heaven without Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ was born on this earth in order to ultimately sacrifice his life for all. With his death on the cross, paying the cost of everyone's sins, past, present, and future. His burial, and on the third day, Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. Jesus Christ, who never sinned, as the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, came to take away the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Ephesians chapter, eight, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Jesus Christ, the greatest gift offered to everyone. Jesus Christ, the only way to eternal life with God. Jesus Christ, the mediator, the reconciler between God and man. Jesus Christ, that left the glories of heaven for you, willing to suffer the scorn and mockings of his people, willing to die a criminal's death for you, and willing to save you. If you are willing to humble yourself, submit to Jesus Christ, and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then take up your cross and follow him. Walk with him daily, and put on the armor of God, and speak the truth in love to others as you magnify Jesus Christ to all that you meet. Serve him, love him, and follow him and love your neighbors as you love yourself. Glorify Jesus Christ and daily sing his praises. And look again at verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So what is the mind of Jesus Christ? When you think about what we've just what I just read through here, the mind of Jesus Christ was humbleness, was meekness. Even though Jesus Christ is Lord, and he is Lord of all, he came to this world as a humble servant. He humbled himself before his creation and was willing to die for you. You and I are called to walk with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering and forbearing one another in love. Just as Jesus Christ is meek and humble, that must be your mindset as well. Problem is, you and I, we don't want to be humble. None of us do. We want to have our 15 minutes of fame. We want to be noticed. We want to be sure others know our thoughts. Being humble and meek is against your sin nature. Your focus is about you and not about Jesus Christ or anyone else.
Jesus Christ willingly died for you. And no greater love hath any man than to die for another. But what, what happens? We so often look inside and look towards ourselves rather than looking upwards toward Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now again, remembering Jesus Christ is God. And that was hard for us at first when we first heard that. When we started going to a church 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, and the pastor says all of a sudden, Jesus Christ is God. And it's like, wow. We had never really thought about it before because we didn't know any better. You know, me growing up in a Catholic background, we never heard stuff like that. My wife growing up with a Episcopalian type background, Methodist background, they didn't talk about stuff like that. And so when they, Jesus Christ is God just really surprised us. We hadn't thought about it, but once we heard it and started looking at it, it's like, how did we not see it before? And the world, the world has trouble with this thought. The world has always had trouble with this thought. His apostles had asked, what manner of man is this? And others considered him to be just a man. And when Jesus Christ made it very clear that he is God, the Jewish leaders picked up rocks to stone him with. And people today still think of Jesus Christ as just a very good teacher, a good man. And as Jesus Christ walked this earth, he was seen as a man by the people. But he is God. The people could not get past their sight and they focused on what they saw rather than walk by faith. They saw Jesus Christ as a man, so when they were told by him that he is God, they decided that he was speaking blasphemously. Jesus Christ is equal with God because he is God. And note that in verse 5, Paul, he refers to Jesus as Christ Jesus. And that was something that kind of puzzled us when we were first born again. And, you know, what did that mean? What, what was that Christ? Was that his last name? We, I remember we asked our, our discipler, you know, what does that mean? And, and they pretty much said, well, yeah, it is kind of a last name. No, it's not a last name. Jesus Christ, the word Christ is his name as the Messiah, the Anointed One, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is his incarnate, incarnated name, the name given to him at birth. So when Paul uses Christ Jesus, he is emphasizing the deity of Jesus Christ. The Christ is Jesus, and Jesus is the Christ. And so when Paul refers to Jesus as Jesus Christ, there he is emphasizing Jesus' humanity. Now in the form of God, Jesus Christ showed the characteristics of God to those he met. He showed God's love, mercy, power, and strength. And only Jesus Christ could do this. No other being could consider himself to be in the form of God. Now, there have been plenty of people over the years that claim to be Jesus Christ, or they claim to be God, but only Jesus Christ is God. Nobody else can speak or do as he did. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, earlier this year, Queen Elizabeth passed away, and her son Charles became king. And at his coronation, King Charles was lauded, and there was much pomp to the ceremonies. In the United States, when a man is elected president and inaugurated into office, 
There are parties and there are parades and speeches and fireworks and it is televised everywhere. When Jesus Christ came to this earth in the lowest of ways, there were no parades in his honor. He did not ride a white stallion everywhere with banners flying and people saluted and saluting and speeches being made. Those are actions that point to man's innate pride and desire for self-promotion. Jesus Christ came here in the lowest of fashions and was a servant to men instead of looking to be served. When you think about it, he washed the feet of the man that would betray him. His beginnings were fairly obscure. God made it that way. Yes, the, 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 the Magi that came to the house later, not on the same day he was born, they knew roughly where to go because of the scriptures. And, and they knew the different things, but overall there was very little fanfare to the birth of Jesus Christ. Now obviously, being God, Jesus Christ could have arrived with much fanfare, but he chose a humble beginning. He was incarnated in the likeness of men. Jesus Christ would have looked like a Jew. The Bible tells us that he also would not, would not have been a handsome man. Why? Because he wanted to draw people with his words and not his appearance. You think about all of the celebrity shows that are on television. You know, I can remember back in the 80s, I think, you know, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous with Robin Leach. Wow, just pulled that name out of nowhere. You know, and, and you know, look at all the, the opulence that they have. And of course, Robin Leach talking in that unique voice of his. And... and focusing on some celebrity that week and their wonderful house and their wonderful cars and, and all these things. You think about all the different award shows that are on television and what is ultimately the overwhelming focus in each of these shows? Appearance. How did this actress look? What designer fashion did she wear? <coughs> And if two actresses wore the same outfit, the critics would have a field day about who wore it better. Who has lost weight? Who has gained weight? Hair color, facelifts, liposuction, personal trainers are the focus of these shows. And the problem is, is that these celebrities have been so exalted by the media so they then feel the need to open their mouths and expound about what, they, what experts they are on various subjects. And people will then hang on their very vapid words. Why? Because of their appearance. So all they're doing is seeing that face in front of them. The words are just bouncing off their ears or they're not really paying attention. They're just focused on the look. And people will listen to them even though they have little to say of importance. Why? Because of their appearance. Why do you think you know, when, when they elect presidents in, in different, all the different offices there are, they spend so much time on makeup and hair and they want to make sure they look good. Do they have the right colors on and, and everything else? You know, if you Think back to when President Trump was in office. Did you ever see him wear a blue tie? No. He always had a red tie. Why? Because red is the color of Republicans. So he never wore uh, a blue tie. People get so caught up in the appearance and, and, and they lose track of what's really important. And with Jesus Christ, we listen to what Jesus Christ has to say because his words are life. His words have eternal me meaning. We do not listen to him because of his appearance. We listen because he is Jesus Christ. 
and he was being will he was willing to have no reputation often he would go to a town and he would heal somebody and would say don't tell anybody that i healed you and that always seems odd why would you not do that because he did not want what would come next and there would be the crowds of people some against him some for him and it made it difficult for him to do what he was there to do you know but I can understand the person's enthusiasm. I just got healed of something. Yeah, I'm going to want to shout it to the rooftops. And that's what we should do now. We don't, we're not under that same restriction. Christ tells us to call out to everybody. This is what he's done for me. This is what he's done for me. He may not fit, heal me ever physically of anything, but he's healed me so much more spiritually. And that's what's truly important. Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You think about that. Jesus Christ humbled himself. That's something you and I find very difficult to achieve. We do not take to humbling ourselves very well. And it stings. It stings and it hurts when someone else humbles us. Jesus Christ humbled himself for you. That's that just is astounding to think about that. What amazing love that he was willing to die for me. Now, there's a story about John Wesley. He was walking in the countryside and he came to a brook. To cross over the brook, there was a narrow bridge wide enough for one man at a time. John Wesley, now just in case, John Wesley is the brother of Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley, of course, we know as the hymn writer. John Wesley was his brother who wrote everywhere and preached everywhere. And uh, he's the one that had said at one point, if he goes through a day without a brick being thro thrown at his head, he must not have said the wrong things or the right things. So, um, and Methodism began through the Wesleys. A long time ago. Anyway, so John Wesley, he began to put a foot, one foot on the bridge when he saw another man begin to cross from the other side. And that man was a liberal preacher of that time. And so that man, he called out to John Wesley and he says, I never give way to a fool. John Wesley stopped, looked at the man, and smiled as he stepped back. John Wesley then said, I always do. Jesus Christ humbled himself for you. He was willing to, to set aside all of him for us to live on this earth. And there are seven steps that we see as we read through this passage that Jesus Christ took for you. Seven steps of humiliation for you. And the first step is that he left the glories of heaven for you. You cannot imagine how great a step that was because we do not fully understand the glories of heaven. But he willingly did it for you. You know, when we read, we sang the song, you know, and can it be in that second verse. And, and the second verse isn't in 99% of the hymnals out there. But that second verse, and it talks about sounding the love, how deep the love is. And that's, it's a, a sea reference when, when on a boat and you want to know how deep, the water is so that you don't run yourself aground. Now, I don't know how they used to do that sounding, but that's what it's referring to, that, that the, they were never able to sound how truly the depth was, and that's how much the love of God is for us, because you can't measure it. You can't put it in a box. It won't fit. You know, it's an infinite love for us, and he was willing to, to do that. Now, the second step, was that Jesus Christ, he emptied himself. He was still God, and that never changed. And Jesus Christ, while he was on earth, was still as much God as a baby in Mary's arms, as he was as a 12-year-old visiting the temple, and as a 30-year-old beginning his ministry. He never left beside his divinity. He dwelt on this earth with limitations, self-imposed limitations. He was still God 
Understand me. Don't misunderstand that. He was still God. That never changed. But now he knew hunger. He got tired. He slept. But he never sinned. Only God can do that. The third step is that he came to this earth as a servant. He lived here as a man, a working man. Jesus Christ, he would have learned carpentry from Joseph. And Jesus Christ was made in the likeness of man, which is the fourth step downward for you. Jesus Christ is God, and he manifested himself in the flesh for you. You know, there's, a, there's an old gospel track, a chick track, that shows a young boy that is fond of ants. I think it's called Charlie's Ants. And, and he would uh, watch them working on their, on their anthill all day long. He was fascinated by them. And in the track, a young girl approaches the boy and tells him that there's a big rainstorm coming and the anthill will be washed away. And the boy yells to the ants, but they're not going to listen to him. And the boy points out to him that the ants would listen if he could come to them in the likeness of an ant. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He left the glories of heaven, and God came to this world in the form of man in order that people would listen to him. You think about when God did show himself in the Old Testament, especially like when the, the Israelites, they've just left Egypt and they're headed to Mount Sinai and they get to the base of Mount Sinai. And what happens? God reveals himself in a fashion. There's the thunderings and the lightnings and the clouds and, and there, there's trumpets sounding. And what happened with the people? They cowered. They were scared. They thought, oh no, if we get any closer to this mountain, God's going to strike us dead. They were afraid. And so what did God do? He had Moses come up so that he could speak with Moses, give Moses the commandments, and then send Moses back down. And that's what God did for us. He came then as man among us. Now the fifth step that Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ did humble himself. The sixth step is that Jesus Christ became obedient unto death. You were born to live. Jesus Christ was born to die. We die because of sin, but Jesus Christ never sinned, but he was incarnated here. He was born here to die. In order for you to have eternal life with him in heaven, Jesus Christ had to die on the cross as a sacrifice for your sins. He laid down his life for you. The seventh step is even death to the cross. As it says there in verse 8, even the death of the cross. Not only had Jesus Christ had to die, but he died on the cross, which is usually reserved for the worst of criminals. Jesus Christ broke no laws. Jesus Christ was no criminal. But he died for you on that cross. And that is the mind of Jesus Christ, to be humbled for you so that you can walk humbly toward others. Now, one day, Jesus Christ will return, and he will be exalted. And that's what the other verses then go on about. He's going to be exalted. He will be magnified, and what a glorious day that will be when he comes here. Amen. What a glorious day that will be, and we'll be behind him, because we'll have already been taken up. But we'll be behind him, we'll watch as he speaks in the sword of his mouth, his words go forth and strike down all against him. But in the meantime, you and I are called to have the mind of Christ a mind of humbleness and meekness, of servitude, to be a servant to one another, to be a minister to one another, looking to serve others rather than be served. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's something we need to remember today, but remember every day, to be a servant to others. 
That's the mind of Christ. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, I thank you for this time with your word. And I thank you, Lord, for the blessing that your word is and the things that we learn of Jesus Christ through your word. And God, I pray that we would rely on you, fully rely on you, trust in you through all situations and be willing as Jesus Christ did, to turn the other cheek, being willing to give of ourselves for others. And Lord, I pray that as we go through this week, you would be the one that is magnified to all that we meet and not ourselves. And I pray that we would have that mind of Christ in the toughest of times, and in the easiest of times. Lord, we thank you because you have been so good to each of us and your mercy endures forever. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.